Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lamaster Smith, or as folks often call me, Dr. J. Each episode of the podcast, I talk with the guest about their experience in rural life and ministry as we search the stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope that I believe are latent in our rural communities. My guest today is Becky McRae. Becky is a lifelong small town entrepreneur. As co-founder of Save Your Dot Town, she shares insights from her real-world experience as a business owner and cattle rancher. Her practical perspective is featured at her highly ranked website, Small Biz Survival, and her award-winning book, Small Town Rules. We'll put that in the uh, virtual bookshelf that we have for the podcast. She's been featured and quoted in books, newspapers, magazines, blogs, podcasts, and university publications. She makes her home base in Hopeton, Oklahoma a community of about 30 people. Her goal is to deliver practical steps you can put into action right away to shape the future of your town. Becky and I have never met in person or ever had any contact outside of social media. I did hear her speak at a conference where I then had to run off to speak. So this is our first time actually getting to talk one-on-one with each other as part of this. So this will be fun. But first, each week I like to start off my episodes with a country music recommendation about rural life and a reflection on that. So I'm a big fan of Casey Musgraves. I was turned on to her song, uh, Merry Go Round, when I first, I think, started my PhD program. But we're not going to talk about Merry Go Round today. We're going to talk about this town, which describes the reality of a small town or even unincorporated communities, which a lot of us will say we're from a small town because we have to say that, even though we're from an unincorporated area in a, in a space. And what it means for that small town to grow and change. Some of the lyrics read, Big enough for a zip code, a VFW, a good Mexican restaurant, a beauty shop or two, got a Methodist, a Baptist, and a Church of the Nazarene. Oh, but don't you forget it, as big as we're getting, this town's too small to be mean. Yeah, it's too dang small to be mean. For me, this song sort of feels like one of those ways that small towns will put on a facade. Uh, Some city of pleasant living, city of, uh, and the folks are friendly, those sort of things about that. At first, it feels like we're trying to put up that front about who we are. But the lyrics continue. Too small to be lying, way too small to cheat, ways too small for secrets because they're way too hard to keep. And somebody's mama knows somebody's cousin, and somebody's sister knows somebody's husband, and somebody's daughter knows somebody's brother. And around here, we all look out for each other. Because I have almost exclusively, except for three years while I worked on my PhD, lived in small towns and communities, this is this song makes me think of the drama, the secrets, the talking. It's everywhere. And it's, for me, it's not a bad thing. I think that's a reality of how community operates. People are going to talk. Secrets are going to get out. These sort of things. It makes it interesting. It makes it, makes it less like Mayberry and more like real life because it is real life. And while I didn't want to, to deal with this song to start with, I warmed up to it. I warmed up to its meaning. And she's focusing here on the term mean. Mean in the sense of cruel and dark. And it made me think of, a, of, the, of this song as a reminder and an aspirational thing. I think even though there's small town drama and gossip, people still do for each other. People still, hopefully, stop and help you change a tire. They'll help you, they'll take up a collection at church if your house burns down. They'll bring over food when someone in your family dies. They'll do the fundraiser for the local school or the local fire department. The reminder is no matter how big we get, the value we don't want to lose is that we are not mean. We don't use each other or people's drama or tragedy against them, against them, and we might still gossip, but we won't leave people in the lurch. That's to say, we're hopefully not mean. And like always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. So now let's get to know our guest. Welcome to the podcast, Becky. What's your experience or thoughts on this song? Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. And, I, you know, like you, I see it as kind of an aspirational sort of thing. This is kind of an idealized view. Mm-hmm. But also, I do believe that every small town, we have people working in a positive way, and there's always some people who are doing negative things. Ah. And so we have the option of what we look at mm-hmm. and what we notice more or where we focus our energy. And so recognizing the uh, the fact that we can all look at what's going on positive and the way that we tell ourselves we are in a large part is who we become. Mm. And so if we talk about ourselves as being too small to be mean and we remind ourselves we don't want to do those things, then we're maybe a little more likely to do the positive thing. 
Ah, thank you. Yes. I, you know, I thinking about that, you feel like there are always people who are working, even if they don't know they're working negatively, they might be working negatively against the town or, or the community in general. And the hope is that we can still want to lean into the positive thing and encourage even those people who are doing negative things, maybe to bend a little bit more toward what we need them to be. I appreciate that. So now I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, we know I gave your I gave your bio the you know the nuts and bolts of what you do, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself, your experience in country life, uh, you know, favorite things, whatever you want to get into. Well, we'll go on with the resume because that's kind of an obvious thing to share. You know, I'm one of those people that I've had job offers from big cities and and had the opportunity that I could have moved to a city, but I chose to stay rural and to patch together a living in a lot of ways. Like I'm sure many of you can can sympathize with that. You know, I've been the city administrator for a town of under a thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, I was a newspaper reporter for my local paper. I've been an antiques dealer and gone to all the country auctions. Uh -huh. um, I was a retail store owner and talked to everybody in town. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a volunteer and an entrepreneur and a cattle rancher. Mm. So it's that it's that thing that we do in rural areas, which is we find ways to get by mm -hmm. and it doesn't always follow the standard urban career path, mm -hmm. beautiful resume picture of who we should be. Oh yes. Oh yes. I think of that in terms of, you know, my job is, is fairly cobbled together. I teach for three or four schools. I'm a pastor of two small churches. I'm a consultant. I now have a content creation podcast situation going on and people in other areas like how are you doing that why well, why aren't you doing this normal academic route one academia is not in the best place right now but two i'm i'm committed to being you know in the rural space and if that means living out my vocation in different ways or my my who i am in different ways so be it i'll let it evolve over time yeah, I think that's smart. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up with my mm -hmm. parents following the oil boom around Texas mm -hmm. and Oklahoma and Kansas. But every summer, um, so we lived in small towns and in those places. And then every summer they would bring us and drop us off with the grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so I spent summers every year with my grandparents in small communities here in the one I live in now, which is Hopeton with about 30 people. Mm -hmm. And then about eight miles away is the big town of Alva, which, you know, somewhere around four or 5,000 people. Mm. Uh, my grandmother knew everybody. I swear she had spies. You'd, I'd go <laughs> home and she'd be like, oh, hey, I know. Did you have a good time down at Holder Drug? Um, uh, yeah. How'd you know? Um, like, oh, the spies, the spies. <laughs> What's well, like the song? Everybody knows somebody. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the other thing about being rural is it keeps us close to the seasons and cycles of nature. Mm -hmm. And especially as a cattle rancher, I, I'm much more attuned to what's going on in the natural world around me. And so I know that even things in my life will have a season or a cycle mm -hmm. and then it may move on. And, you know, sometimes you're in a season of like, okay, it's time to rip everything out and start over. And sometimes you're in a season when things are growing and understanding that is a lot easier if you are already closer to nature. I think I took a workshop one time about how we need to encourage people to reconnect to that seasonality of things. Yeah. That it's, uh, you know, right now we can go to the grocery store in a lot of the more urban areas and find strawberries on the shelf year round. Now, they may have come from somewhere where strawberries are in season, but like where I am, strawberries are in season in May and June. And there's a special feeling of strawberries are in. Let me go get some strawberries from the local local strawberry patch. And, and and that's also the same with our lives, that things will come and go as things need to happen. And we can't get hung up on needing strawberries year round uh, that, and, and expecting them to be local. So that's that reality of that. Yeah. And we can't get used to expecting our lives to always be in that springtime period of growth because our lives won't always be in that Oh, cycle. no, we will, definitely not. A different season will come around mm -hmm. and it helps mm -hmm. if you can recognize it when it comes around and go, mm -hmm. okay, but I know it'll, you know, if it's something bad, I know that another cycle will come soon and so I can prepare. Oh, exactly. That sort of planning for that prepare and knowing that you need to be prepared for that change, to be preparing yourself for that, whether that's just your relationship with your parents as you age and they age, whether that's how your job looks 
whether that's the kind of housing situation you have. It's not even just about rural jobs and careers. It's about being in place and knowing how to pre be prepared for whatever comes next. It's life. Yeah, life, exactly, exactly. So I know that you traveled around a lot as a child going from place to place following the oil boom, and I know your current, your current job keeps you traveling, speaking, and consulting in different places. Where have you been lately? Oh my God. So you and I met in, uh, or didn't meet, we met, we passed and didn't meet <laughs> yes. in North Carolina mm -hmm. at the same conference, the rural centers conference there. Um, since then I've, uh, done, uh, I've been here in Oklahoma for a presentation to a college class on rural economic development. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've attended some things virtually. Uh, I traveled to Kentucky for a community visit mm -hmm. and then, the Brushy Fork Leadership Summit there in Berea. Um, and I've been to Colorado, East Central Colorado, mm -hmm. out on the high plains there. Interestingly enough, I've had some more Oklahoma events. I don't always have a lot of Oklahoma events um, because I'm kind of local. And so I don't, <laughs> you don't always get invitations from where you're local. Um, but it seems like this has been, this is one of those seasons when I've gotten a lot of chances to reconnect with the people in my region. Mm. That is great. You know, sometimes the local is nice. I, I intentionally teach classes near me in person just so I can reconnect with the people who live here. A lot of my classes are online because that's the nature of the world right now. But yeah, the, being able to stay local some, it's kind of refreshing. It's like, oh, you only live 30 minutes from me, <laughs> not multiple states over. I can I can say y'all and I can, oh, yeah. I can pack my, my presentations full of local photos and I can talk about Alva and Hopeton and people have heard of them yeah. and, you know, all those things that come with being able to do something in your region. Yes. Yes. It's, it's so nice. It's so nice. You've been, you did, that's so great. Um, is there anything else about yourself you want to share? Favorite, uh, you know, favorite foods, favorite regional food that you, when you go somewhere? Oh my gosh. I tell you what, chicken fried steak, gravy, Oof. mashed potatoes, green beans, mm -hmm. fried okra. Ah, oh, yes. That is my wife. Like if she can find fried okra on a menu, it is hers. She will go to that restaurant over and over again. Oh my gosh. I love fried okra. Yes. I know here it's a liver mush in this area. You probably, you probably not been to this particular very small region of North Carolina that has liver mush as their favorite thing. Uh, so it, liver it's mush. pork. It, what is, I'm, you never heard of that? No. Okay. So you may have heard of something like a scrapple, uh, yeah. Okay, so it's similar. It's more of a more of a loaf sort of situation. It is a um, it is sort of the processing of organ meats uh, right. uh, of pork mixed with usually a grain and spices, and it is it is cooked. You can eat it raw, but I recommend frying it in a pan and serving it on like a biscuit or something like that. It's very anything on a biscuit is always. Bad. Oh yeah, it's 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 good. People are afraid of it sometimes, but I recommend trying it at least once. Uh, Shelby, North Carolina, it's the home of Earl Scruggs, one of the fathers of bluegrass. Uh, it has a um, a liver mush festival, as every small town has their festival. Everybody has to have a festival, and it, which is great, right? Like I I I love to go and experience different things in North Dakota. It was the um, Juneberry ice cream, and oh. oh my gosh, you just have no idea. That, awesome stuff. That sounds good. I've got students in the Dakotas, and I have yet to make it out there to visit any of them. <gasps> and I just ha I have this need to go there. I mean, I'm, I'm located in the South, so like I can quickly get to Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. But uh, it's getting yeah. to the Dakotas, you know, is, is a day's drive at least, or flying into a small airport somewhere. There is an event called Rural X put on by uh, Dakota Resources, mm -hmm. and they're based in South Dakota, but they draw a lot of North Dakotans as mm -hmm. well. And they do this wonderful event. It's online and finally back in person as well. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken there before. And then this past year, I just participated virtually because um, my colleague Deb Brown was there in person. I was there virtually. Um, so we kind of got both experiences but it's a wonderful grouping of rural people and talking about issues you'll recognize. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be another opportunity for you to connect with your Dakota students mm -hmm. is around something like this that brings together people from across their region. Ah, yes. I think that's important. I, I like regional conferences too that really are able to pull in like the North Carolina conference where they really focused on mm -hmm. North Carolina. I don't know if you got a gift box, but I got a gift box at the end of it that had a bunch of locally made North Carolina things. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you, y'all make some awesome, awesome stuff, but there was no fried okra in the gift box. That'd be really weird was if there, there was. Could you imagine? I would eat it right away. <laughs> Hopefully it's still hot and not gotten that soft being sitting out for a while feeling. Oh, I'll still eat it. I will put some salt all on right. it. All I'm saying, so 
If you live in the world and don't know what a fried okra is, I've just defined liver mush for you, but we need to define fried okra. Okra is, of course, a, a vegetable. It's often a, a lot of people use it in th as thickeners and soups and, the, and stews and those sort of things, but it is delicious, just chopped up, battered in like a cornmeal batter and pan fried, or sometimes deep fried, depending on what you do. Delicious, especially when it's real hot. You don't need any kind of topping to go with it, but some people serve it with like a remoulade sauce. Mm, you know, I've seen people dip it in ranch, and I think you're missing out on the opportunity to just eat oh, it. Oh, yes, especially if it's just seasoned <laughs> well with the right salt and pepper and seasonings. Oh, yes. So yes. good. So good. So now that this is now a food podcast, uh, we're going to move on to, we're going to take a short break, uh, and uh, then we'll come talk about some of the stories Becky has, because I'm sure she has more stories than she can count about rural hope and faith you know, wherever she's been. So we'll be back after these messages. Welcome back, everybody. Now, Becky, what I like to do for all my guests is ask for as many stories or experiences or examples of how they see faith and hope in rural communities as they're willing to share. Just go ahead and share share the stories that are coming to mind for you. Well, I mentioned that earlier this year I went to Kentucky. I was scheduled to go to Eastern Kentucky with a group called What's Next East Kentucky, which I thought I just love that positive outlook for that, for the name of the group. And... Uh, they unfortunately they were hit with some really awful flooding. Oh yes, and it disrupted everybody's lives and communities, and of course the event. And so I didn't get to go to that, but it turned around. And the Brushy Fork Institute Leadership Institute invited me to their summit, which was just like almost next door in Berea, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. and asked me to speak about uh, disaster and recovery and and resilience and mm -hmm. i mean there's there's a lot to cover there yeah um but i i shared a lot of stories about people specifically taking action mm. to improve the social ties in their community because research from iowa state university shows that communities with stronger social ties yes. tend to do the best after a disaster and those with weaker social ties are more likely to they said wither after a disaster oh that's a good that's word awful. wither's so, a good word i think though. even though it's awful but wither is a good word uh, it, it expresses what can happen in a community oh, yeah. so in speaking to the people in kentucky i told some stories like uh delmont north dakota or south dakota delmont south dakota was struck by a tornado. And this is a town of um, 321 people at the time. Mm -hmm. And so while there, no one was killed, fortunately. So, but they had a lot of damage, like half their structures were damaged and mm. more than half of their people were displaced and had to go live somewhere else mm -hmm. um, or move in with family or whatever. And one of the things they did as they worked through all of the hard infrastructure stuff is Someone suggested that they do an art project to show that they were still a community. And they, they hit upon the symbol of a cardinal, which is a symbol of death and also birth and also yes. renewal. Mm. And so the, the people of Delmont, like 300 people, cut out, you know, the little wooden outlines of cardinals. And then mm. they painted them. And so an artist opened her studio and anyone could go in and paint one Cardinal or a bunch. And then mm -hmm. the girl scouts had a, a Cardinal painting party and the senior Ooh. citizens had a Cardinal painting party. And right. So it was something that everyone in the community could participate in. And they, their plan was because you know what a tornado does to the trees is strip all of the, the leaves off of them mm. as well as, you know, and then damage the branches and all of that. Um, but so the town like had lost all of its summer color and so they had these bright red cardinals that they went and their plan was hang them in the trees and it would be mm. a visible symbol that we as a community are going to come back and that we are connected. Yes. And so they hung a thousand cardinals in trees oh. all around their community, 300 people. And so even if you just let them hang a cardinal in a tree, you're participating, you're part of the community and then everyone could see it. And that is a story of hope. That is a symbol of saying, all right, we will mm -hmm. come back as a community and we will endure. And that town of Delmont 
uh, this past September actually celebrated their annual harvest and, and Kukin festival, which is more food. We'll talk food, but the, yeah, yeah. they celebrated their big festival again this year, um, mm-hmm. showing that this community in a different form mm-hmm. has moved forward. And I, that's the kind of story that I took to Kentucky to say, you can make deliberate action to bring your community together to improve your social ties. Yes. And that's your best symbol of hope. Mm-hmm. And it's that faith that we have in each other and in in humanity mm. that allows us to make that kind of a statement together. Mm-hmm. I love that. It's that sort of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, but he talks about, you know, having faith that humanity can keep going and that hope that we are not done. That means the future is not over. We have not been foreclosed upon and we can keep going. And that just sounds so like the, the Cardinals are just a symbol of we are still here and we will keep going. Oh, absolutely. That's beautiful. I, I love that. It makes, it makes it the community art projects. People often talk about how community art projects really don't accomplish anything. Uh, and I get that cause it's not, you know, I get their sense, but you know, it's not, it's not providing food or shelter. But it's providing that sort of spiritual, hopeful reality for people of we are still here. We still have yes. the ability to do things beyond beyond our limited issue or beyond the present situation. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. If yeah. we have time, I have one other story to share in particular oh, that I'd yes. love to tell. And yes. it's a story from Iowa. And it involves my colleague, Deb Brown, who lives mm-hmm. in Iowa. Um, and it's the, t- the town of Webster City. And okay. this is a town of almost 8,000 people, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a major employer that one of those big factories that employed, you know, everybody in town. Oh, yes. And then they had, you know, it had dwindled for several years. And then they made a big announcement that they were going to close the factory. Mm. And then the, they laid off a bunch of people then. And then the next year they laid off more. And the next year they laid off more until they got down to zero. And between the time they made that announcement and the time that they actually closed was like three years. And, you know, everybody's like, maybe we can convince them to stay and we're going to, you know, so it kind of divided what the response should be because it wasn't, they were, it wasn't clear whether they could maybe stop it or should they be moving on? And so they, it just was this long, slow decline. It really hit the community hard. And so for several years, their employment in their community just kept going downhill and downhill. Um, And at about that point, their Chamber of Commerce director job came open. Mm. And uh, Deb applied for that job. And as she's driving into town for the job interview, she's counting the empty buildings she sees downtown. She gets to 14 empty buildings and she's starting to ask herself, should I take this job? Do I want this job? Yeah. And she, they offered her the job, even though she was not from there. So they were open to somebody new coming in, which is another mm-hmm. factor that the Iowa State University study found is actually uh, tied to how well your community prospers. Are you open to new people taking the lead, people who are new to your community? Oh, that's, that's good. You need, if you have a link to the study, I would love to share that in the show notes. And I will absolutely give you that link. Thank you. So they were open to having somebody outside and they made the job offer to Deb and she took it bravely Mm -hmm. um, and she reports to the job. She's on her first week on the job and the movie theater in town closes. Oh no. And then, so people said to Deb, it's like, it felt like a gut punch Mm -hmm. that everything else we've been through and now the theater is gone. So Mm -hmm. in one of her first chamber of commerce executive board meetings, The guy from the industrial authority looks at her and says, what are you going to do about all those empty buildings? And Mm -hmm. Deb's brain amazes me. She's just on the spur of the moment. She says, here's what we are going to do. We're going to do a tour of those empty buildings. We're going to show off all the empty buildings in Mm. town because I believe people here want to start businesses and we need to help them. So they went out. And they convinced people to let people tour their buildings. They, everybody swept their sidewalks and washed their windows and like cleaned up so that they could welcome people in. They told history of the buildings. They told what was possible to do in the buildings. Now they did a tour, like 43 people took the tour and Deb declared a success, which is a great Mm -hmm. move. And then they spent another year just talking about it, 
um, that list of empty buildings, business owners sent it to their friends in other towns and said, hey, we're moving forward. You should come and rent one of these buildings. Mm. And um, they shared it in the high school and the nearby nearest college, shared that list of empty buildings and talked about opportunities. Mm. And then, you know, Deb puts out a press release and, you know, media follows up. And the, the eventual outcome is within 18 months, 10 of the 12 buildings that had agreed to be on the tour were filled. And wow. that turnaround included the movie theater. The people of the community raised the money, bought the building, revitalized it, upgraded projection to digital projection, which was also in the wow. turnaround right then, and hired staff and reopened their movie theater. Oh, and gosh. And all of that is this same thing of creating us having faith mm -hmm. that there is a positive future mm -hmm. and then taking steps that show your hope mm -hmm. of what you're going to do about it and so that that deliberate action of of not trying to be embarrassed by the empty buildings but let's show them off let's start talking about what could happen mm. as well as they did a thousand things to build stronger community ties they did a lot of events they did a lot of work with you know trying to bring people together in community they did summer nights concerts downtown you mm. know everything you can think of all at once mm -hmm. so while you could go to webster city today and you could still find somebody who had worked at the factory and is still angry and disaffected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can also go to Webster City and find people who are working on a positive future today. And oh. their employment level has gone from that deep pit that it fell into. They have recovered every bit of that employment mm. without a new factory. They did it all themselves. Ah, and if people didn't just result, resort, because easily that can, people can resort to uh, sort of retail jobs or service industry jobs. As, but you seem to see that say that they did. It wasn't they. It was more lateral moves for a lot of people into other employment that's less. You know, not to say that working at the Dollar General is bad, but it's often what people just settle for. The interesting thing is there was this belief, and people talked about it this way that they would talk about well before the factory closed and mm -hmm. back when we had the factory, and oh, then yeah. they would talk about if they talked about the future, it was like well when we get another factory, yes. then we'll be in better shape, and. Um, after the tour of empty buildings, it had been about a year, they had filled most of their buildings, they had, they were well on the way to saving the theater, and I, Deb and I were having a phone conversation, she and I didn't work together yet, we were just friends, and we were talking, and I said, how long has it been since anyone mentioned the factory, and she went, mm. oh, it's been months since anybody brought up the factory, they didn't get another factory, people opened their own businesses, people, yes. Um, the local agricultural manufacturer was able to expand because here's this additional workforce. Then, you know, other people came in from out of town and opened businesses that also hired people. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of different shifts. Nobody went, uh, well, not nobody, but not very many of the old factory workers went to, say, the agricultural factory. Mm -hmm. Most people went and did something different. So it's like we talked about of seasons and cycles. Mm. Your life will go through different seasons mm -hmm. and the people's employment in Webster city went through different cycles and seasons. So while they didn't go straight back to the way it was mm. because time doesn't run that direction, they were able to move forward because they started talking about what things could be different. They were able to start creating that different future together. Ah, oh, and beautiful. I love that they went to the middle, to the high school and the college and say, here is rural opportunity not the narrative of rural decline that we can so often feed to our high schoolers and college students, but that there is opportunity here for you to bring your, your passion, your degree, your connections, and continue to thrive in this rural space. And that just struck me as that's something we need to be doing in our towns. When we do career days in so many of our high schools, I see it's like, well, there's the factory, there's the, you know, the car dealerships, there's the agriculture, there's the college. Uh, but it's less about imagining opportunities that are present. Absolutely. I think there's there's a number of things that occur to me. One is that San Saba, Texas used to run a blue collar career fair that mm -hmm. was a response to the fact that over half their high schoolers were uh, or all half of all of their kids in school were deemed at risk. Either they had a language barrier or they lived mm -hmm. in poverty or another mm -hmm. problem that left them being labeled as at risk. 
and their director for economic development at the time was named Tony Guidros, and he said, these are kids that have a future. And so he started the Blue Collar Career Fair to connect those kids with jobs that they would be qualified for and that were had a lot of openings in the region. And they, he did it all hands-on. So mm -hmm. um, the, the people who are looking to hire uh, people to work in the uh, dirt moving industry, the, you know, they need some bulldozer operators and, and mm -hmm. road grader operators. They brought a little bobcat which is a very small, y'all are rural, y'all know this, it's a small dirt moving tool, you know, it's got a little bucket on the front. And they let the kids test out the bobcat, right? Like that was instead of a lecture. And, you know, the electrician is like, here, we're going to use some tools, we're going to strip wire, we're going to hook things up, right? It was all hands on. And that is a much better way of connecting kids with the opportunities that are there and giving them hope than it is to say, well, we'll have the election, el electrician in to lecture you along with the dentist, right? Like, no, let's get the kids out there and let them try oh, this. I, I may be in a different career if I got the chance to try out a bobcat in high school. Oh, my God, I know. Have you ever <laughs> messed with a bobcat? It's so fun. I've not. I just recently learned how to drive a tractor. I, somebody wanted to take away my rural card, so I had to learn how to drive a tractor. I'm glad you learned. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Oh, that's that just, that's so, I mean, that, it makes me want to, you, you know, uh, these uh, rural spaces, uh, and I don't, I don't know if you're familiar at all with like the plight of the rural church right now, but many churches in the U.S. in general, not just rural, are graying. They are people yeah. in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they're looking for ways to reconnect, but they often feel like we don't have any kids in church or we don't have any things like that. But finding ways for churches to get involved in promoting the rural community and the, uh, as, uh, as a place of opportunity and a place of hope, uh, it, it's something I think we can do because oftentimes churches are those anchor institutions that are there regardless, but they often sort of can't figure out how to get involved. So participating in things like the career days or the places or, or getting involved in the commerce department or, or the chamber of commerce to help with uh, promoting the opportunity in the community would be fabulous. I think it's in Cavalier, North Dakota. There is a church that started co-working for the nonprofit organizations and other mm -hmm. uh, volunteer groups in their community. Because what does a church have? It has a building that sits yes. empty way too often. And so this church opened their doors to other organizations in town to use like classroom space mm -hmm. when they were not in session. So this became like a co-working space for the, for the organizations. Mm -hmm. And because they were working in the same location, you know that people were talking to each other. Oh, our organization mm -hmm. is working on this. Oh, did you know that we're going to have an event on this date? Oh, they yeah. had natural opportunities to better collaborate because mm -hmm. they were in the same space. And it was less threatening for, I'm sure, the church leaders to say, we'll let in other organizations than just random entrepreneurs. Um, so if that mm -hmm. was a, a good transitional step towards doing something like a full-blown co-working and entrepreneur support and oh, yes. hugely positive. And I mean, and the church, I mean, can make a little bit of money through the help cover the utilities to do that through just a small uh, a nominal fee, uh, just, uh, and create this space of, and then like people in the church could, you know, come in and just learn about what these organizations are, especially nonprofits and agencies and tutoring programs and education or organizations. And I often tell churches if, tell churches too, like, why don't you figure out a way to have like a mental health professional and a nurse practitioner come in, you know, even just two days a week to be present in your community because so many people are having to commute 30 minutes to their doctor or 30 minutes to a therapist. And if they're in that community, that's another way to, it's, it's non-threatening. It's not an entrepreneur. It's someone who's established, someone we know has credentials and creates that space too. I do like this idea of the church building as a place where additional health and mm -hmm. wellness options could happen. Yes. Um, and then on the subject of entrepreneurs in church buildings, I will say that if your church is not entirely made of over 70 year olds, if they're even in their 60s, that's a very entrepreneurial group. Mm. We know that people in that age group start businesses at a very high rate. So mm. your entrepreneurs may be your own people. And so it may be much less threatening to start than mm -hmm. what some leaders might initially think. Yes, because it may be a member or a community person you know who just needs that extra space to get out of their garage or their or their dining room table to mm -hmm. to start to to hold their inventory. Yep. 
Oh, it's so wonderful. Uh, well, uh, Becky, thank you so much for being here. I've already picked up so many things that I want to just mull over and think about. Now I've got, I'm going to ask you to give me some more things. Uh, each, uh, each of my guests I asked to bring a piece of media, whether it's, or, or multiple pieces of media, whether it's books or music or TV shows, video games, resources you have that are giving you hope at this time for rural spaces. One person who is giving me a lot of hope is James Decker, who is currently mayor of Stamford, Texas. Mm. And he has a podcast called West of 98, uh, which is a, which is a nice geographic reference. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also does a newsletter at Substack. So it's West of 98.substack.com. Great. And you can find his, uh, you can link from there to his other resources. You can also find him on Twitter. I think he's at James Decker in a year, but I don't remember what I, I, I will look it up and put it in our show notes. So Absolutely. So up. James is giving me a lot of hope. He's written a lot of really great things. I've really enjoyed reading his updates from his community, as well as his thoughtful, um, over-analytical type of personality that you're going to love. <laughs> And uh, the the way he looks at and reflects on how rural communities can move into the future together is going to gives me a lot of hope, and I hope some of you will take hope from it as great, well. Great, great. Ah, oh, thank you so much. This is this has been wonderful. Uh, and so I know that people are going to want to reach out to you or learn more about you. Where can where can my where can my listeners find you? Deb and I do work together at Save Your Dot town that's mm -hmm. our name and our website address so right. it's not a dot com it's a dot town because we're all that you know oh, I and love, so I, you I can, didn't know there I didn't know dot town was an option that may be what I changed my website so to. we are we are so high tech I know but <laughs> um the uh, to find me personally you can find me at Becky com slash connections mm -hmm. which is a list of different places you can find all the stuff that I have online Great, great. And you are on Twitter because that's where I reached out to you. So you can follow her on Twitter as well. Absolutely. And then we none of us know what's going to happen with Twitter in the coming minutes, hours, days. Yes, and weeks. she is currently, we are all currently on Twitter. But <laughs> exactly. We, 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 <laughs> Who knows? We, we will figure something else out if something happens to Twitter or it becomes such a space that we're not comfortable being on. And that is honestly why I created my beckymccray.com slash connections page mm -hmm. is because I wanted to be able to give people a place where they could find wherever I was currently because yes. things, seasons and cycles, things change. And mm -hmm. I wanted to be, to have a signpost beginning page where people could find very easily find where they might find me today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and again, thank you so much for being here. This has been a, a fabulous time and I'm just going to close out the po podcast for us now. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get podcasts. If you have questions or suggestions for guests, topics, or just want to say hi, reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to my wife, Shandela Mastersmith, for writing our theme music titled Hildebrand. I record and produce this podcast because I have a deep hope that rural communities can grow in their faith and hope and create a future for themselves. Thanks for listening. Live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass if you weren't trying to find me? Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground. In a great big yard across from the fire station. Oh,